Good afternoon, everyone. I hope your fast is going smoothly, as smooth as can be. I thank you for joining me this uh, this afternoon, one hour roughly before Chatzot on Tisha B'Av, Tavshin Pei Aleph five seven eight one, as we will conclude with Hashem's help, the final chapter of Megillat Echa that we've committed to studying over the last few weeks, beginning on Shiva Asar Bet Tammuz, and we've, uh, we've engaged in, in studying one chapter a session, and we are now on chapter 5, the last Perek of Yirmiyahu Anavi's work and writings regarding the destruction of the Bet Hamikdash and that of Yerushalayim. Um, for those who are following, you can, I guess, open up your book of Kinot to follow with me, or a Tanakh, and uh, we will go through this final this final chapter. Unlike the first four Perakim, uh, chapter 5 is not written um, alphabetically, Aleph through Taf. It is really just a, a bunch of uh, important, powerful statements. And we will hopefully go through one by one. So, <clears throat> without further ado, we begin with Pasuk Aleph. Zechor Adonai Mehayalanu. Habita Ure et Cherpatenu. Remember Hashem, what has befallen us. Look and see our disgrace. Here, the Al Shicha Kadosh explains that the suffering of a poor man who has never seen wealth, cannot be compared with the wealthy man who has uh, been reduced to become destitute, who is now publicly disgraced, now that he has to beg for his, his sustenance and his food and his parnasa. Um, so therefore, the, the exiles that were thrust from the heights of glory to now the lowest conditions are asking Hashem are lamenting remember Hashem what we have been during our time of of loyalty our inheritance has been turned over to strangers our houses to foreigners What is the inheritance that is being referred to in this Pasuk? Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers. The Midrash says, it refers to the Bet HaMikdash. Why would the Midrash use or explain the Bet HaMikdash to mean inheritance, Nachalatenu? To emphasize that the Kedushah, the sanctity of the Bet HaMikdash remains from generation to generation. And even after the Shekhinah has has left it, but the Kedushah is still there. Contrary to other places in the world, um, such as Har Sinai, which the sanctity, the Kedushah, seized after the uh, the Divine Presence of Shekhinah left, the Harabait, where the Bet HaMikdash stood, the Kedushah is still there. Um, and therefore, this is the concept of inheritance. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers. According to one version of the Midrash, the word nefcha stresses that it was similar to Sedom. Sedom was also overturned. It was flipped over and remained desolate. And even the enemies um, couldn't find, will not find comfort dwelling there. Yet omim hayinu ve'en av imotenu ke'almanot. We have become like orphans and there is no father. Our mothers are like widows. Among the other nations, we were as miserable as orphans. And so why, if we're orphans, why mention that there is no father? There is no father is added because typically people come to the aid of orphans. The mitzvah and the Torah to come and assist the widow and the orphan. But that was not the case here as the Jewish people were orphaned. There's a beautiful interpretation by Sefer Ner Leragli that that this refers to the severing of the Torah and the traditions and the customs that came with the result 
of the demise of the elders and the prophets, um, since uh, they, they, they were no, there was no longer a connection, there was no longer what to remember, because everybody was gone. Not only now we feel orphaned and we have no longer a connection to our father of the customs in the Torah that was that was taught to us. We pay money to drink our own water. Obtain our wood for a price. Here Rashi, the first Rashi of the Perak actually, says, Memenu bekesef shatinu, Shayu yereim lishov mayim minan nahar, that the people, the residents were fearful to draw water from the river, mipenei ha'oivim, because of the enemies. Ve'ainu koni mehem bekesef, and they would instead buy the water from them for a price. It's hard to understand in today's generation, where many of us now are used to going to the supermarket to buy water, even though we have water for free. But we still go and buy water. But in the olden days, water was uh, a free resource. They went to the went to the river, they went to the lake, they drew their water, and that was what they had to drink. But they were so afraid of the enemy that they had to go and purchase the water. Same thing for the wood. The wood, the trees, you know, they could have just cut down the trees and they had their wood. But they were they were afraid. Midrash Lekachtov understands this homiletically. It says that, of course, the water is a metaphorical reference to Torah. And therefore, he translates the Pasuk, Memenu Bekesef Shatinu, we pay money to learn our Torah. Meaning they didn't even allow us to learn Torah without bribing them. We had to somehow convince them with money. Here's our money, please let us, uh, let us learn Torah. Al Tzavarenu Al tzavarenu nirdafnu. Upon our necks we are pursued. Yaganu velohu nachlanu. We toil, but nothing is left of us. Rashi says, Be'ol avoda kasha yaganu le'esof mazonun chasim. Due to the tremendous burden and weight of the work that we did, we became tired and couldn't even... Um, collect the food and the, 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 the things that we needed to survive. Velohu nachlanu, and we nothing is left of us. Yagienu beyadenu, haivim govim bechotvim hakol bemasim. The enemies would come and snatch everything from us with with taxes, the gulgaliot, vanoniot, and other types of um, levies and fines uh, that uh, that were placed uh, placed upon us. Um, there is a midrash that states that Nebuchadnezzar told Nebuchadnezzar that Hashem, or the God of the Jewish people, loves repentance. He loves teshuvah, so he has to prevent the Jews from doing tefillah, and that is implied from the from the pasuk, from the words velohu nachlanu. We were not given the opportunity. We were not allowed to pray. We weren't even given the opportunity. To do uh, to do teshuva. Moving on to pasuk vav, Mitzrayim natan uyad ashur lisbo alachem. We stretch out a hand to Egypt and to Assyria to be satisfied with bread. Rashi here quotes a very shocking midrash, and he says, "Derech adam hanofel." There's the way of a man who falls. And he wants to get up. Stretch out your hand to someone that's next to you so he can help you get up. This is what we do. You know, you need help getting up, so you, you lift up your hand. And here too, we stretched out our hand to Mitzrayim so that he should help us. Ul Ashur and to Assyria, Shiashpienu Belahmam. So that they, so that they would help us fight in this war where we are, but they didn't, they didn't fight for us. <clears throat> they left us aside. <clears throat> what was happening over here? The midrash tells us that the Jews were, were used to have a, a trade with uh, Egypt. They traded their oil with Egypt for for food that they sent to Assyria, in hope that if the enemy one day was to advance. Egypt and Assyria would come and uh, and help them, but that pact 
that promise was fruitless. And when the attack came, uh, the allies, so to speak, of Egypt and Assyria ignored, ignored her. And that is what is being lamented now by the prophet Yirmiyahu in this pasuk. Mitzrayim natanu yad ashul ispo alachem. But they didn't come, they didn't come to help us. Moving on to pasuk Chet, um, Zayin, sorry. Avotenu chateu ve'enam. Our fathers have sinned and are no more. Va'anachnu avonotehem savalnu. And we have suffered for their iniquities. Here, <clears throat> our rabbis tell us that this is in reference to the spies in Parashat Shelach Lecha. That is, our fathers have sinned. Our fathers indulged in the needless cries and weeping of the Tisha B'Av on the ninth of Av during the time of the spies. And therefore, we suffer for their sin by this uh, weeping, lanetzach, this eternal weeping that was imposed on us throughout the ages. It says Rabbi Israel Salanter uh, that this teaches us a moral lesson. Fathers who do not train their children in the ways of Torah are considered hotim. Our fathers have sinned. Avotenu chateu. They are considered sinners. Even when they are, even ve'enam, even when they are no more. After, their, after the father has passed away, if you don't train your child to be Shomre Torah Mitzvot, they're considered sinners even after their deaths. Because the children continue the sinful ways for which the father is responsible. The children suffer for the father's sins. Suffering which the parents have to bear the onus. And this is where Rishal Salanter says how the obligation on the parent to direct his child in the right way. And the and one who doesn't, this is what the Pasuk is referring to. Avotenu chatu ve'enam. They've sinned, and even when they're not around anymore, they are still sinners. Savalnu. Some want to say that the word savalnu does not mean we have suffered, but rather that we have tolerated. Savalnu can also mean tolerated. That while our ancestors uh, greatly regretted their misdeeds, we have come to terms with that lifestyle. We think it's fine nowadays to do to do the things that we do, and we don't in, do introspection. We don't look deep down in ourselves and find ways to correct ourselves. We don't get sick worrying about our actions. It's just something that becomes standard. So therefore, we're okay with it. Savalnu avonotehem. It is uh, it is something that we have now uh, tolerated. Avadim mashelubanu porek en miadam. Slaves ruled us. There is no redeemer from their hands. In mortal danger we bring our bread because of the sword of the desert, of the wilderness. The uh, Rashi says, In mortal danger we bring our bread. While we are in mamash, sakanat nefashot, mortal danger, every time we would bring food, from the fields, the crop, the produce, whatever it is, we, you know, it was a danger to our lives because of the sword that was prevalent in the desert and that was ready to pounce upon us. Um, moving on to Pasuk um, Yud, Yud. Orenu ketanur nichmaru. Our skin was scorched like an oven with the fever of famine. The word nichmaru here, nitchamemu, scorched or became extremely red, red hot. That's what Ashon comes over here. With the fever of famine. Rashi, uh, Rashi just quotes, again, Lashon serefa usrefa, a sort of a, a feeling we have. Um, the, 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 just like the internal famine expresses itself through scorched skin, so too a person who sins in private manages to uh, eventually those sins get announced uh, publicly and disgraces the sinner as well. That's the um, homiletical understanding of this pasuk. Pasuk Yud Aleph. Nashim betzion ainu betulot be'are Yehuda. 
they ravaged women in Zion and maidens in the town of, of Yehuda. One of the Midrash uh, writes that Nebuchadnezzar commanded his troops not to touch married women because the God of the Jews hates lewdness. So the unmarried woman would then plead to the men to marry them without any commitments just to carry their name. And uh, unfortunately, many of them were raped and killed. And the Midrash writes only three maidens uh, escaped, escaped from this. A very, very sad situation. Sarim beyadam nitlu. Penezekenim lo nedaru. Leaders were hanged by their hand. Elders were shown no respect. Um, rather than submit themselves to the tortures which the enemy would subject themselves to, um, they hanged themselves by their own hands. This is what they, they, would, rather, uh, they would rather do rather than face the, uh, the punishment of the enemy. Even the elders were shown no respect. When, when a governor entered the city, uh, he took its best men and hanged them. And the elders would go to him and try to dissuade him, try to convince him to do otherwise, but he refused to listen. Uh, not even the elders, not even the chachamim of the city were showed, were showed any respect what was going on. Bahurim tehon nasau unarim ba'et kashalu Young men drag the millstone and the youth stumble under the wood. Rashi says here, when the enemy would would drag us or take us with chains, they would put mill, millstones on our shoulders and, and things that were heavy to tire us out. And as a right, and they would stumble under the wood because of, uh, of the weak strength that they had. They didn't have any strength anymore. According to the Al Sheikh, the children grew so weak that they would stumble even over a branch lying on the road. That's how weak they were based on the tremendous weight and burdens that were being placed upon them by the enemy. Zekenim Misha'ar Shavatu Bahurim Mineginatam. The uh, the elders are gone from the gate, the young men from their song. Here, the elders refer to the wise men, the Chachamim. That they have now departed the gates of Halakha. This is what it means here. The elders are gone from the gate, the gates of Halakha. <clears throat> and the young men refers to the young students who would study Mishnah by heart. And they would put a the, the words of the Mishnah to a harmony. You ever walk in a Bet Midrash, you hear the, the people singing the Mishnah, singing the Gemara. It's, a, it's an easy way to, to memorize. It's an aid to memorization. But now these Bahurim no longer were singing anymore because they couldn't, they couldn't study. Some say that this Pasuk refers to that of the Leviim, that you had, you had two groups, two functions of the Leviim. The older Leviim would guard the gates of the, of the temple and the younger ones would sing the, the songs the Shir Shelyom that we recite every morning in Shachrit, that's what the Leviim would sing, and they would also play in their musical instruments. Now both are gone. And that's the Keni Mishar Shavatu Bachurim Ineginatam. Even that is no longer available. Pasuk Tet Vav. Shavat Mesos Libenu Nepach Le'evel Meholenu. Gone is the joy of our heart. Our dancing has turned in into mourning. Um, the, the, the fact that now that the, the elders are gone from the gate, now that the young men uh, have stopped singing, as we just said in the last Pasuk, we now have a void. We have now some in, in our whole inner self, our whole essence of our of ourself is, is lacking. There's no joy in the heart. Our outward joy is missing, uh, expressed by our dancing. That now has turned into, into, public, into public mourning. Nafela ateret roshenu, oi na lanu ki chatanu. The crown of our head has fallen. Woe to us, for we have, uh, for we have sinned. Um, now that the Bet is destroyed, 
how are we going to atone for our sins? The problem, woe to us, we have sinned and we have no way of rectifying it. Previously, a person made an avera, he would bring an offering. He takes an animal, or whatever animal, even a koban micha, whatever, he goes to a, the bet amigdash to atone for his sins. Now there's no bet amigdash. Our sins are hanging on top of our heads. There's no way for us to atone. Oy lanu, woe to us. It's an obvious confession, a recognition that everything has befallen uh, them is, is the result of their sinful ways. This is the reason what, what's happening. We have n- n- no way of fixing it. And that's what the Navi is lamenting right now. Moving on to Pasuk Yudzain. Al ze haya dave libenu. Al ele chashechu enenu. For this our heart was ill. For these our eyes were dimmed. One more Pasuk. Al har tzion sheshamem shu'alim hilechu bo. For, for hearts for Mount Zion, which lies desolate, foxes prowl over it. Rashi here says, "Al zehaya daveli benu." On for for um, for this, our heart was ill. Al meforash b'mikash l'acharav. It's in reference to the next pasuk. The fact sheshamem hartzion v'shualim hilchubo that now hartzion is desolate. And foxes prowl over it. That's the reason why our heart feels sick. Because instead of Jews going up on Har Tzion to bring their korbanot and, and the Kohanim and the Leviim servicing the Bet Hamidash, instead there are foxes there that are that are prowling um, <clears throat> and and undisturbed, and no one's doing anything about it. Of course, uh, we must mention the Gemara that um, that. Rabbi Akiva saw the foxes and, um, and, and the fellow sages as well. And while everybody was crying, seeing the foxes, Rabbi Akiva was actually smiling and laughing. They asked him, what's, uh, what, what's happening? Why are you laughing when you see such ruin, when you see foxes trampling and walking over the Bet Amidash? And he gave his famous answer that he knows that at least now, if one part of the prophecy is fulfilled... Now, I know the second part of the prophecy will be fulfilled. That there will be a time that we will exit this Galut and come to rejoice one more time in the Beit HaMikdash. So he drew consolation from the swarm of, of foxes because he proves that the prophecy about the return to Zion <clears throat> will be fulfilled. The question is, but Rabbi Akiva should have also mourned at that time. It was a time of mourning. So what exactly was he doing by laughing? Where was the tears? Where was the crying? So the Marasha explains that it was, ex- it was specifically the foxes that gave him the encouragement because it showed him that no nation or being will benefit from the land other than the Jews. Impossible. Even though, uh, Only foxes can, can you know, ravage the, 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 the spot, but no other nation. As long as they were exiled, there would be no nation that could experience any substantial pleasure from the land. And that comforted Rabbi Akiva because he knew that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was guarding and saving the special attributes of Eretz Israel for the Jewish people. And that's him, what, 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 brought, him, uh, what brought him comfort. Um, <clears throat> almost, almost finished the, the Perek. Ata Adonai le'olam teshev kis'acha ledor vador. Yet you, Hashem, you are enthroned forever. Your throne is ageless. Uh, Hashem's kingship is ageless, and therefore the throne will ultimately be restored. Right? There can't be an enthronement without a throne. There can't be a king without a consort. It must be Yerushalayim is the throne, Israel is the consort. We know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will come back and sit on his throne. So there's a little bit of a nechama here being mentioned by Yermiyahu, which leads him to the next statement, which is Lama la netzach tishkachenu pasukaf. If that's the case, why do you ignore us la netzach eternally ta'azvenu le'orech yamin? Why do you forsake us for so long? It's not fair. Rashi says, Lama la netzach halo nishbata lanu becha. You've already promised that this was not going to last forever. So why is it that you, it seems that it's lasting forever? Why do you ignore us for so long. Hashivenu Adonai Elecha Venashuba Hadesh Yamenu Kekedem. 
bring us back to you, Hashem, and we shall return, renew our days of old. Lots written on this on this pasuk of Hashivenu Hashem Elecha Ben Ashuba. Um, the, that uh, Bnei Israel addresses here Hakados Baruch Hu and says, "Listen, all we ask for is a little bit of, of of help, of divine assistance. If you initiate the action, Hashem, and draw us near to you, we will repent for our sins and we will return to you, Belev Shalem. Indeed, Hashem initiates by placing thoughts of Teshuva in in our minds." In the, in the mind of man, our responsibility, our job, our mission on earth is to pay attention to those thoughts and not ignore them. The Midrash notes what seems to be a very clear contradiction in, in, uh, in Pesukim uh, between Hashem and Israel and how to react or who's supposed to take the first step. HaKadosh Baruch Hu insists, based on the Pasuk in Malachi, Shuvu Elai Ve'ashuva Elechem which means, first, return to me, you Jews come to me, and then I will return to you. And Bnei Yisrael answers this pasuk, Hashivenu Adonai Elecha Venashuva. First, bring us back to you, and then we shall return. Uh, neither side gives in. There seems to be a dispute between Bnei Yisrael and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Who is going to take the initiative? Who is going to take the first step? How do you explain the dispute? So Bnei Israel says, we must first see your salvation. We want to see the Yeshua and that you feel close to us. That's how we know that you feel close to us. And then we will do the Teshuvah. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, no, it doesn't work that way. That the salvation, the Yeshua, the Yeshua must be preceded by Teshuvah. Without the Teshuvah, can I bring you the Yeshua? So therefore, it, you know, it, 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 there seems to be a little... Uh, dispute argument going be here between Bnei Yisrael and Hakadosh Baruch Hu. The Eben Ezra translate the word Hashivenu, bring us back in the physical sense, meaning bring us back to the physical city of of your name, which is Yerushalayim, and we will resume serving you as before. One can argue that now that we have Yerushalayim again, God has did His part. He's did his part. We have Jews living in Yerushalayim. We have Jews in control of Yerushalayim. And therefore, it's now up to us to resume serving him the way that we once did. In fact, if you pay attention to the word Venashuva, the word, in, it's pronounced Venashuva, but it's spelled Venashuv. The last hey is missing in the Ketiv, the way it's written in the Megillah. It's missing a hey. And the word Venashuv without the hey is equivalent to that of of Mashiach 358, who we hope will uh, succeed in um, when we repent, uh, repent properly. So, Hashivenu Hashem Elecha Venashuva, Hadesh Yamenu Kekedem, renew our days of, of old. According to the Midrash, uh, Kedem, what is renew our days of old? Kedem, old, refers either to the time of Adam, whose repentance was accepted. Or it was in the time of Hevel, when there was no idolatry, or the period of Shlomo Amelech, when the Jewish people uh, enjoyed tranquility and financial uh, security. Ki im maost me'astanu, katsafta alenu ad me'od. For even if you had utterly rejected us, if you had utterly rejected us, you have already raged sufficiently against us. Um, Rashi says, Ki ma'os me'astanu, for even if you have utterly rejected us, bishfil shechatanu, because we sinned, lo haya lecha learbot ketzef ad me'od kasher katsavta. You shouldn't have increased your anger more than you already did. It was already too much. It's too much for us to handle. You've already raged sufficiently against us. Katsavta alenu ad me'od. Rav Levi Yitzchak mi Bardichev explains this pasuk in a very, very special way. He says, when a, if a man w- was to divorce his wife, he would divorce his wife for two reasons. Either for having found in her an ervat davar. An ervat davar is an immorality. She was unfaithful. Um, and she did something, she sinned with another man, so therefore he divorces his wife. Or 
because she no longer finds favor in, in his eyes. Uh, for whatever reason, they just don't get along. She didn't do anything wrong, but they just don't get along. Maybe she's not, she, she lost her cooking touch, and he, or whatever it is, other reasons that a man might divorce, divorce his wife. If he divorces her for the first reason, he may never remarry her again. That's what Dalacha says. If she was with another man and he divorced her, that's it, he can't remarry her again. But if it's for the latter reason, I didn't like the way she cooked, so I divorced her. And then she went to cooking school, and she went to a special school to, to learn how to become a chef, and now she's a fantastic chef. And I want to remarry her. You're allowed to remarry her in that case. So this is how the psukim makes sense over here, says Rav Levi in Sebi Bradichov. Hashivenu, Hashivenu Adonai Elecha Ben Ashuva. Bring us back. This is how it's to be understood. You did not divorce us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because of Ervat Davar. You did not divorce us because we were immoral, that our behavior was so improper that you could never take us back. But rather, you divorced us. Ki ma'os me'astanu. You divorced us because you utterly rejected us. That's what it was. We no longer found favor in your eyes. We were sinning. But it wasn't something so bad. And therefore, you have the ability to bring us back to you. And in fact, that's why we repeat the pasuk of Ashivenu Adonai Elecha Ven Ashuva Chadesh Amenu Kedem. In order, Rashi says, Mi peneshem esayem bedivret tochacha, hu tzrach lichfol mikrash lefana pam acheret. We don't want to end on a bad note. We don't want to end that Kadosh Baruch Hu rejected us and he's given us tremendous rage. So we end off with Nehama. We end off with the Pasuk, Hashivenu Hashem Elecha Ven Ashuva. That we, uh, that you, you, we have, we believe, we fully believe that you will bring us back to you. I saw one beautiful idea that, that I'd like to end. The Sefer Baruch Mi Banim suggests that Hashivenu Adonai Elecha Ven Ashuva Chadesh Yamenu Kekedem The word Kedem forms an acrostic. It's an acronym for Cain, David, and Menashe. And uh, who are Cain, David, and Menashe? Each of these three individuals committed on some sort of level one of the three cardinal sins. Of course, Cain was the cardinal sin of murder. Cain killed his brother uh, Hevel early on in, uh, in history, at the beginning of history, in Parashat Bereshit, David uh, sinned with Bathsheba. His sin, although the Gemara tells us he didn't sin, nevertheless, it had a trace of adultery, of Gilui Arayot. It's a second cardinal sin. And of course, King Menashe, who the, the prophets and uh, the Chachamim explained because of his idolatry, his Avodah Zarah is the reason why the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, the first Beit HaMikdash, and why the Babylonians, led by Nebuchadnezzar, came to lay siege and destroy the temple. He served idols. But all three of them, all three of them, their repentance was accepted. So there's a lesson. The lesson is, as low as we may fall, no matter what it is, it could be the murder of Cain, it could be the immorality of David, it could be the idolatry of Menashe, the king, we should never lose hope. And that is the message as we as we conclude the Megillah, Hashivenu Adonai Elecha Venashuva Chadesh Amenu Kekedem. It is this Pasuk that we are going to carry with us over the next seven weeks up until Yom Kippur, where we where we plead and beg Hashem to forgive us for our sins. And hopefully, hopefully, we will uh, be witness to this prophecy of Hashem bringing us back to Yerushalayim. Hopefully Yom Kippur will be, by the time we get to Yom Kippur, will be that day where we'll be atoned completely for our sins and we will have and we will merit to see the rebuilding of the Bet HaMikdash and Yerushalayim in its most beautiful, beautiful form. I want to thank everybody for joining us over the last five sessions slash three weeks as we went through this. It's a great accomplishment and uh, I'm happy and I was uh, I feel honored and privileged to complete this Megillah with you. If this is your first time just listening tonight and you want to catch up on the other four Prakim, by all means, they are on the podcast, Finding Holiness, findingholiness.buzzsprout.com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you hear your podcast, you can hear the other four Prakim. And again, Bezrat Hashem, we will be Zoche to Yeshuot Venechamot 
Abeatlaha and only only good tidings with the building of the Binyan Bet Amidas Bimanabi Amenu Amen. Wishing everybody else, everybody here present, an easy rest of your fast. Have a great afternoon.